about uh, the toolkit uh, for, for Timory in both Python and C++. Um, if uh, you recently registered and you, you didn't get the emails that I've been sending out, um, all the tutorial materials are on GitHub and uh, NERSC Timory tutorials. It's on this ECP 2021 branch, which is currently says the default. Um, if uh, you need access to resources, please visit this resources page. Um, it, you can sign up for a nurse training account by following this link right here. Um, and the reservations today that we'll be using for uh, the Haswell nodes are here. And for the GP nodes will be here. Uh, you can also pull down um, some Docker containers. And there's also some, some uh, local installation instructions if uh, you would like to uh, install locally. Okay, so um, starting off today, we'll I'll, I'll probably spend about 20 minutes or so um, on the Python, Python toolkit. Um, and then I'll get into sort of the, the basics of using the interface of the C++ uh, toolkit. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a bit how to use the, uh, the toolkit in a lightweight way so that you can collect intermediate measurements without sort of touching global storage. Um, I'll teach you how to write a component. And then we'll talk some about uh, replacing functions and wrapping functions. These uh, last two particular examples uh, do require uh, Linux. They, they rely on uh, features that aren't available on Mac OS or Windows. Um, before we get started, uh, does anybody have any questions, particularly anybody that uh, is just joining today and didn't join last week? Oh, I just had a question that whether we'll be using the systems today when the exercises, or, or is it just going to be a presentation today? Oh, no, no. Today will mostly be exercises. Okay. So do we have to uh, get everything that probably was done on day one to understand the day two part or? Um, no, no, there, there may be some things, uh, maybe like nomenclature or something you're, you're not familiar with. Um, if that's the case, I'd probably go into tutorial day one introduction and then just take a look at the slides. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I also, I updated the apps. Um, I don't think we're gonna have time to cover it, uh, but um, hold on one sec, we had a parking puppy. Um, there's sort of an advanced example that I, I built here that you can look at. Um, also the, the custom dynamic instrumentation um, which you learn a bit more about uh, when you learn how to write a component. And then essentially there's these sort of routines that are um, used um, used uh, by Timory Run. You just simply name this function uh, to the same name as the library, and then you tell Timory Run to load the library. And then you can insert your own custom components into the dynamic instrumentation module. Okay, so um, without further ado, let's go on to um, sort of the, the tutorial day two materials. Let's start off with the Python toolkit. Um, I didn't particularly write um, any, any exercises here, but you are you're welcome to open up Python uh, on any of your systems and, and sort of just look at the, the help pages uh, for when you, when you import either Timory component or Timory.storage. Essentially, um, what the Python toolkit makes available to you is that each one of those individual components that uh, are available through um, Timory avail, 
here they all um, they all have individual classes that are available to you in Python. And the way these are designed is that uh, you can locally create little instances, call the start and stop routines, and then assuming they, they do collect data, uh, you can actually retrieve that data. And none of that data is uh, stored in global storage unless um, you call uh, push and pop uh, before you call start and stop. And down here in the storage uh, example, you can sort of see how, how that fits together. Um, see here, I create a wall clock and every iteration I actually push. And then I call start and stop around this little just timing algorithm. And then I pop every odd iteration. So in this little, little algorithm here, you should have five measurements and global storage. And then you can iterate over the wall clock storage later. And there's two different formats. There's sort of the, the, the flat layout and the hierarchical layout. And the hierarchical layout has inclusive and exclusive times. And if you uh, look through through the man pages, you can see all the data that is, that is available to you. And you can see from the printout here of the flat storage, uh, the hierarchy is sort of represented by, by two fields. Um, this prefix, uh, where the actual uh, uh, depth is, is represented by an indentation, and then also this depth field. You can see that uh, for the statistics, as I said, there was five measurements counted. You have your, your total value, your min, max, square root. Um, and then for the hierarchical storage, you can see um, this actually has to be processed uh, recursively, et cetera. Um, does anybody have any questions? Would y'all like me to do a, a demo or do y'all find this sufficient? Um, I'll probably give y'all 15, 15, 20 minutes to play around with it if you want. But feel free to ask any questions. Uh, Johannes, could you ask your question here too? Sorry, what was that? Uh, could you ask your question here in Zoom? You said something. Oh. Are we missing? Oh, I, I'm just wondering. Uh, let's see if I can if my annotate works. Um, so, uh, in that print value function, you don't print the prefix here like you do up here, oops, sorry, like, uh, um, oops, there, there you're printing the prefix. I don't see it anywhere here, but in the sample output, the prefix is shown. So I was wondering if, if the um, example script here just is missing that line. Oh, yes, yeah, probably I uh, updated the script that generated the output. And then forgot to update the actual script in the in the code. Mm. Yeah, that, that that's all. Um, that, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that like as a sanity check. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So I actually have a follow up question. So that means when you um, get the tree data, then the prefix um, isn't that doesn't have this, um, uh, uh, what is it, the call graph uh, data in front of it, you know, the, the, that indent uh, bit in it. It's just the function name then. Yes. All right, brilliant. <laughs> I've been manually filtering that out again. 
Yeah, and so if, if need be, um, I, I could actually create a, a lookup table for this. You know, it's, it's usually e easier to iterate over the tree. I could make uh, a callback that simply you could pass in the hash and it'll look up the, the raw function. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. If you just just file a, a, a GitHub request and I can I can put that in very quickly. All right. Thanks. Okay. Um, any any questions on the the Python uh, stuff before we move on to the C plus plus toolkit? I have a question. Does this Python code work on the GPU now? Um, Oh, so getting some open wait, are you, are you on, you're on a CP, GPU node? Yes. Um, no, it should. This, uh, this is a storage example, maybe GPU and IO has issues, but module general load. Python code would work. Oh, hold on. Module load CGPU. Uh, did you... Uh, it looks like you have the right. Uh, could you try switching to the uh, Python 3.7 module on Core GPU? There's there's a weird thing with OpenMPI. So the 3.7 bindings have a different OpenMPI, which I think is working. Do I need to load the uh, OpenMPI module? Well, no. Well, you can just load. So there's um, there's a a Timory CGPU developed. GCC Python 3.7 module and a 3.8 module. And if you load the 3.7 module, okay, that, that will have an internal build of OpenMPI. Okay, then I'll unload my... Yeah, I'd probably just do a module purge and then uh, load CGPU, GCC, and then... Um, so the storage um, example would work? Uh, yes, it should. Okay. I know, okay. Then swap the Python. So it comes to Python or what do I do? Yeah, so module swap Python. This time I even didn't uh, swap Python. That's weird. Well, so the module module module, pur module purge module load to memory, and then it just worked. But okay. I think I did a purge earlier and load Python. Um, yeah, I did the same thing before earlier. Then I tried to load OpenMPI, but then <laughs> yeah, it just yeah. worked. The uh, the the module files actually, if if they require. Open MPI build loading. Okay. It worked. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, so moving on to the C++ toolkit, unless there's any remaining questions. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about about the design for the first uh, probably 15, 15 minutes or so, um, and then we'll actually get into the exercises and spend about thirty minutes on each. Um, okay, so if if you're going to use the, the 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 toolkit API, it's it's somewhat important to understand how how the 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 pieces fit together. So components components can essentially uh, do anything. In so much as they can, you know, collect uh, data measurements. Obviously, um, they can forward markers to uh, third-party profilers. Uh, you can turn on and off profilers. You can have them activate wrappers around other functions or deactivate them. They can replace uh, function wrappers. Uh, they can. Um, take arguments and return values being returned from those functions and uh, inspect them and log them, or they can define like a, a fixed interface for executing callbacks and your uh, user-based callbacks. Um, when there is no, for components, there is no uh, required base class. I um, mean, Timur really doesn't have a, a, a defined interface uh, with respect to these functions uh, the member functions or static functions in a in a component there are hold on I have no idea what is going on with the puppy Okay, sorry. Um, there, there is no required base class. Um, um, Timory doesn't have a, a, a real interface. Uh, it handles uh, sort of differences between interfaces through, through template metaprogramming internally. Um, but in general, I would recommend using the uh, static polymorphic base class um that it simply just makes it much easier to to implement a a component um, and the way you inherit from that base class is whatever you name your base class you pass that name in as the template parameter to the base class and then uh, you specify sort of the uh, the the data type that you want to use for intermediate storage Okay, so when you're collecting a measurement, it doesn't have to be the data type that you know uh, you're returning from your your Git function. It doesn't have to be this data type. It's how you want to uh, store the data in between measurements. And when you when you specify that data type, it, the default behavior is to provide you with two values: a a value field of that type. Um, and then a, a, a cum um, data field for accumulating those values. Um, in general, components define, say, one measurement. Okay, so you know, um, like if for a, a wall clock um, timer, it is simply just a one little wall clock instance. So one one timing instance. And if for uh, you need to store uh, configuration data, you can do that in static member functions. And uh, ultimately, Timory only for the most part cares about the names of these functions. So it's perfectly valid for one component to return a double from the git and another to return a vector of a double. Or you can say have a start function, which takes no parameters or you can only have a start function which takes an integer or really anything. These, these can take any, any arguments whatsoever and in general can return 
just about any type that they want. Um, uh, in the bundlers, a lot of the times, uh, many fields, what their return value is, is, is somewhat ignored. Um, but th this components are pretty much designed so that you could actually um, adapt any class you have that's sort of similar to a, a class and uh, a component and layer Temery on top of it. Um, and components should not directly add themselves to, to the, the persistent storage. This is, um, by not doing that, that's how um, uh, we, Temery achieves reusability in components. Okay, these, these components are, are supposed to be designed so that um, you don't have to use all the, the template layering. You should be able to use the class itself directly without having to go through through any of the other Timur stuff. You can just imagine a component as a simple, say, timer abstraction that you probably already have in your code. It should be, should be pretty much written just like that. Um, and you should like, so the components shouldn't have any direct references for the most part to, to any Timur based concepts. Um, if, if you do need to store configuration info in the component, I highly recommend using a static function which returns a reference to a, or a pointer instead of a static variable. Um, that's because Timory will lazily initialize a lot of things. And if uh, lazy initials, when lazy initialization happens uh, before main, uh, there's a thing called the static initialization fiasco. And if you use initialization like this, uh, you can run into the static initialization fiasco. Um, but if you use this style, which I recommend, uh, it avoids any of those issues. Okay, so now hopefully, um, well, first off, does anybody have any questions about um, what components are? Or, or anything that I just covered. Okay. Okay, so um, you have, you know, your, your components, which range from, you know, say NVTX markers to wall clock timers to hardware counters. Um, now you would typically use the bundlers. Um, bundlers look a lot like um, sort of a, a, a standard library tuple with uh, member functions. Um, so you essentially define um, one of these, these tuples with an explicit set of uh, components that you want to use. Okay, and remember, because components can call other components, you, there are, it's, Timur even has a, a, what I call a user bundle, which is sort of a abstract uh, way to, at runtime, add in components. Um, so you can, you can define a generic component which handles adding other components. But this, uh, these bundlers take an explicit list of components that you want to use. And in general, there's four flavors. There's a component tuple, and these types are, are always on. So essentially, it allocates all these types on the stack. Okay, so it holds an internal um, data type of, of a STL tuple. So for example, for a component tuple, wall clock, CPU clock, you have a tuple of that wall clock class and the CPU clock class. And uh, with component tuple and component list and component bundle, um, when you call start and stop, it implicitly uh, pushes to, to global storage. Okay, unless, unless you use uh, something called quirks, which I will, which I will discuss later. Um, there is, so the main difference between the tuple and the list is that the list 
is essentially a set of types that uh, you want to optionally activate. Um, so whereas these, all these types are allocated on the stack, all these types are allocated on the heap, and there's there's various. Um, you can pass a callback into the constructor or set it for the type which activates components. So uh, these are useful for um, essentially uh, defining, um, looking up some, say, environment variable or input setting and then activating them uh, at runtime based on whatever user specified. The component bundle is sort of a hybrid of uh, a, the component list and the component tuple. Uh, in so much as the types that you specify, if you want component tuple behavior, you just specify them normally. If you want component list behavior, you specify the type with a pointer. And the first template parameters, a thing are called, you know, an API, and that's essentially um, a, a a common type for all these components, so that effectively, if you disable this API, say, you know, you create a project specific API uh, in Timory and you use uh, this API and component bundles. If you disable this API at compile time, it essentially eliminates all these types and effectively removes all instrumentation from your, from your code. Or you can also disable it at runtime. You can set this API to not available at runtime. And at runtime, it will disable collecting any of its components. Okay, so by default, um, you know, there's there's a a project Timory, and that's uh, um, one that Timory provides. But you can you can provide your own APIs. It's essentially a way to separate out. Um, different collection uh, things if you know if Timur exists in uh, different codes. And then finally, there's the lightweight tuple, which is very similar to the component tuple, except it's um, it's designed to be lightweight in so much as it doesn't really do anything implicitly. Um, you have to explicitly call push, you have to explicitly call pop as towards the global storage. Um, it's designed to sort of be the, the, the fastest um, handle that's available. Additionally, there are um, variants to, to these first three types, where if you just replace component with auto, they'll, they'll call start and stop automatically in their constructors and destructors. OK, so let's uh, take a real quick at a example of a um, some a bundler example and let's implement the same set of operations with with the different bundles so i'm going to use these these three um, components so i'm going to explicitly enable wall clock cpu clock and then this user global bundle and the user global bundle lets you insert um, components at runtime um, there's a thing called scoping, which I'll talk to you later. And I'm just going to find Timory API as to be the project Timory. So component tuple, I'm going to explicitly list all three, simply call start and stop. Um, the stop here is not strictly necessary. If it was started and it goes out of scope, it will call stop. And the component list. Okay, remember all these types are optional at runtime. So I can set a global type initializer, which is just a callback that any time um, a component of this type gets uh, created, it calls this callback and initializes wall clock. I can also provide a lambda in the constructor um, so that for when this instance gets created, it initializes the CPU clock in the user global bundle. With a component uh, bundle here, 
I first specified the API. I set the wall clock to always on. And then I specified the user global bundle as optional. I configured the user global bundle to add in CPU clock. And then I used that initializer to activate user global bundle. So this was, was not passed in. The only thing that would be collected here is wall clock. Does that make sense to everybody? Speak up if not. Okay. So, and then finally here we have the lightweight tuple and the lightweight tuple, as you can see, instead of just calling a start and stop in order to actually uh, get it in and out of global storage to create entries in global storage, um, I actually have to call push and pop. And you'll see the benefit of that when I talk about the lightweight usage and exercise too. Okay, let's talk a little bit real quick about the bundler member functions. So the member functions within these types, which you see here. Nearly all bundler mem member functions essentially look like this. Um, they have the member function, they take any and all arguments and they uh, use perfect forwarding to forward those arguments. And then they, they return um, essentially a reference to, to this type itself. So that allows you to, to call member functions uh, in sequence with each other. And you'll see that a bit later. Okay, so as I said, this Bundler member functions take any and all arguments and they perfectly forward those arguments to, to all components that are bundled. And let's take an example of say these three components. So we have foo here with a member function called sample and sample takes no arguments. In the second instance, we have um, a type, a component bar, which takes which has a sample member function and takes an argument of a std array um, of a constant character array of any size. And then we have a spam component, which doesn't provide sample and just has start and stop. Okay, so I'm gonna to bundle together foo bar and spam and do a component tuple and then say in a signal handler, I'm going to, to create an instance uh, statically of this component tuple. And whenever the signal handler gets called, I'm gonna get a backtrace of eight frames and I'm gonna call the sample mem member function uh, and pass in that backtrace. And effectively what Timory will call is it will call sam this sample member function without any arguments. And it will call this sample member function and pass in this backtrace. And for spam, it will essentially do nothing. It will quietly figure out that there is not a sample member function at compile time and emit trying to call um, spam.sample. So you, you know, May ask yourself why? Why does sample get called here um, when I am passing in a backtrace? The reason for that is um, effectively, if if a member function like this is provided without any arguments, that means it it, it doesn't need any arguments to operate. Okay, so the fact that I'm call, passing in arguments doesn't mean that this member calling this member function is invalid because it doesn't need input. So Timory just assumes that in this situation, because you are calling sample, regardless of arguments, that it's valid to call this member function. Okay. This uh, detection of spam not having a member function is is essentially avoids uh, you having to 
provide every single possible member function that a component could take. Uh, it's, it's essentially, this is sort of critical to, to unifying an interface between components. And then lastly, what if you wanted to call um, bar.sample and not foo.sample, okay? I'll explain a little bit more about how one and two actually work, but as far as three goes, um, there's, there's essentially a, a, an overload where you can say piecewise select and specify which components you would like to explicitly call, and then you can pass in whatever arguments, and it will only call the components in that type. So I'm going to talk a bit now about operations. Does anybody have any questions on bundlers? Okay. Okay, so as I showed here, when this sample is called, I pass in what is effect effectively a templated type called operation sample. Operations um, define how to, to execute these operations for a given component. They are, they are templated on components. And generally um, take a, a reference to a component as the first argument to their constructor or their function call operator. And they perform a series of compile time checks to figure out which mem member function can call. And traditionally, that is the first check is whether or not it can call that member function with the arguments that were provided. The second is, can it call that member function with no arguments? And then assuming A and B fail, then it selects C, not try and call the member function at all. And these checks rely on a mix of what's called spin A, um, substitution failure is not an error, and uh, overload resolution rules. So if you aren't familiar with spin A, uh, you can read about it on c++reference.com. Um, it's essentially a way to select different function overloads at compile time. Um, when you reflect on the type information that's being passed in to the functions. Operations use what's called uh, expression spin A. Um, and that means it actually sort of forms that function call expression that, that we're testing for. And if that's not a valid expression, then it, it silently fails and then moves to uh, the next overload. Okay. And then the overload resolution rules let me actually order um, the way that those checks happen. And the easiest way to, to handle the overload resolution rules is sort of with integers. So if I have these two function calls, foo int and foo long, if I call foo int of zero, the best match is foo int, whereas if I call zero with a long, the best match is foo with long. If I call something with like an unsigned long, it has to do a conversion to one of these types and it's uh, considered ambiguous. Okay, so if I combine, if you combine overload resolution rules with spin A, you can ensure that, and then pass in something like zero here. You can test whether or not this function, uh, you can, you would essentially test this function first and if spin A fails, you actually remove this function from being selected and you move to the next, okay? So most operations um, look like this. They have a public constructor and a public function call operator. And you can see I pass in a reference to the object here. I sign, I just pass in a simple zero and then I forward all the arguments. Using these overload resolution rules, it first tests whether or not 
object can be called sample with those arguments. And if that, if that succeeds, then it actually calls that function. If this fails, if this test right here fails, then based on overload resolution rules, it then tests this function. It checks whether or not object.sample is valid. If this succeeds, it calls object.sample. If this fails, then it simply does nothing. And it selects this last one, which is the long long. Okay. Um, any any questions on operations? You can you can take a look in uh, in the source code. If you ever have a question about why a function is not being called, just find it. You'll find all these operations essentially defined the same way. Okay, so now that I've explained sort of bundlers and components and operations, let's, let's put it all together. So when I call bundle.sample with that backtrace, we, we assume that, that this bundle type has a member variable of, of, of a tuple of foo bar and span. Let's call it data. This essentially internally expands to operation sample template on foo. It extracts a reference to foo and passes in backtrace. Does the same for, for bar, reference to bar, and passes in backtrace. Spam, reference to spam, passes in the backtrace. It goes through those compile time checks and essentially after inlining, you essentially have the reference and then a direct call to that memory function. That is the, 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 the basic principle of how Temery is able to um, bind together um, various components and, and accept any, any input data type from the user and perfectly forward that data type to the components which accept that data type. Um, just some additional notes. Uh, if you want to call a member function without predefined support, okay, so I have, as I mentioned, all these operations that you can do, okay. Um, you know, once for calling a measure member function, once for calling sample, reset, blah, 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 okay? If you wanna call a member function that doesn't have predefined support, you have two options. You can essentially define your own operation class, um, like what's here. And then use the generic invoke member function and pass in that operation. Okay, so that essentially allows these bundlers to call any member function that you, you want. Um, another option you have is you can actually explicitly specialize um, these, these operations per component. Say, you know, you can specialize operation start and get operation that start to call another member function. Okay, this, this particular feature is, is, is quite useful um, if, you know, uh, when you have local, you're building, say, local tool, and you want to modify uh, the behavior in a bundle uh, without having to change how the component itself uh, works. Like, for example, um, you know, in the first day, that time M executable we have, so that drop in replacement for time. Uh, for, for various reasons, I actually needed uh, certain components to not call the start member function. 
and not call the stop member function. So all I did in, in time M is I specialized these, these operation starts and re-implemented essentially this uh, for start and stop to do absolutely nothing. And then the final note would be these, these bundle operations um, are actually passed through a generic operation with three template parameters. Um, so the component type, the operation type, and then that common API type. The, the, the purpose of the, this generic operation is it does two primary things, is um, it, as I said, um, with these various bundlers, like component list and component tuple, component list holds data types that are allocated on the heap, whereas these are in, on the stack. The generic operation essentially provides easy, uh, ensures, ensures pointer safety by detecting at compile time whether or not the type is a pointer or not. And if it's a pointer, it actually does the pointer um, check itself before calling into the operation. Okay, so that way you only have to define your operations assuming you have a reference and that operation will never get called with um, a pointer or um, you, and you don't have to worry about uh, dereferencing pointers and etc. Um, the additional benefit of this is um, instead of uh, having to specialize everything for a, for instead of having to specialize operations, every single operation for a given type, you can actually um, define an API and specialize this generic operation on your API, partially specialized, and then do a modification to, to all types and how they call, um, they call those operations. Okay, so um, now we're, we're gonna move on to, to the exercises. Um, but does anybody have any questions on anything I just covered? I know it, feel, feel free to ask. I know some of y'all probably aren't used to looking at, at, at templates quite so much. So if you have any questions, even if you feel like it's, it's stupid, please feel free to speak up or send me a Slack message if you don't want to speak up, but I'm happy to clarify anything. Okay, well, let's go into the basic usage example. Okay, so in the basic usage, um, we're gonna start off, we're gonna do some initialization and finalization. I'm gonna modify this example.cpp. Um, as before, uh, I would go back to apps, run build.sh, and then source the setup environment.sh. And uh, when you run this build.sh, they'll be installed to that same bin folder um, as the apps. Okay, so when you're initializing sort of the, the, the C++ template API, uh, you have a lot more available to you. You can set um, settings, uh, the default settings to just basically anything, you know, whatever the default behavior you want before you call Timory initialize. Um, you can call uh, Timory arg parse. Um, and that for specific settings adds in sort of command line support. Um, an important thing to note here that if, if you do want to use the Timory command line options, if, as, if this dash dash is specified, 
Temerary arg parse will, after it runs, remove everything after arg zero and this dash dash. Okay. So if you run this right here, after Temerary arg parse is run, it effectively gives you example 0, 0, 110. Okay, it'll remove these, these Temerary arguments from the command line list. Okay, this helps it interoperate with, um, with various, uh, with, with command line options that may already exist in your code. Okay, then we're going to go over, we're going to create some instrumentation. Um, I haven't really talked about quirks here. Quirks are essentially um, a way to modify uh, bundle behavior um, from those defaults. Okay, so remember I said component bundle doesn't automatically start when you construct it, but you can add in a, a quirk called auto start that will automatically start it. Uh, they're all listed here in the C++ utilities uh, with descriptions. Okay, so there's there's a config, which is just sort of a wrapper for multiple um, arguments, but there's, there's auto start, auto start, um, explicit start, explicit stop. You can pass in explicit push and explicit pop. And, and, and get uh, the behavior of say component bundle to look more like the lightweight tuple behavior. Um, you can pass an exit report so that it'll print itself out when it gets destroyed. Uh, you can avoid initializers, you can have a not store, and then you can fix uh, whether or not when it pushes to storage, uh, the scoping gets pushed into a tree a storage, whether or not it's flat storage or timeline storage. Okay. So, um, okay. So you can read through that and we'll, I'll give you time to work over these examples. Um, we're going to have you use the global bundle and insert, um, you know, new components at, at runtime. And we're going to show you how to disable things at runtime, uh, how to disable things at compile time, and then there's sort of um, an advanced usage uh, scenario that I show you here for effectively how you can use these um, operations uh, generically without, without you know, uh, use the operations without anything else. Um, so here we're actually just going to take this vector that's uh, in the code and we're going to use the uh, generic serialization operator and serialize it across, um, get that data aggregated from all MPI ranks and then we're just going to print it out to a JSON. Um, and then there's, there's sort of uh, the sub measurements that are detailed uh, quite a bit here. So this this last little part in the advanced section we're not actually going to cover today, but it's there for reference. Um, so you can go in, start modifying mm.cpp and example.cpp, uh, follow the instructions and um, let me know. You know, I'll be on Slack or uh, you just message me if you have any questions. We'll have We'll give you about probably 30 minutes for this. So 10, 10.45. Actually, let's make it 10.35, 10.40, give you about 25 minutes. Okay, hopefully that uh, clears some of the exercises. Um, feel free to, if you, if you work through them later and you have any issues, feel free to 
file an issue or um, send me a message on, on Slack. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, the uh, zero one section for lightweight usage. Um, this is sort of to demonstrate uh, how Timur can use be used for intermediate measurements. Um, so in this example, um, consider the following implementation in mm.cpp, where we are going to uh, manually use the, the, the chrono uh, steady clock and compute uh, the elapsed time to do this, this loop and count the number of times that um, we, we, we computed this calculation. And we're going to compute an average for, for how long this, this loop over A takes. Okay. So after we execute uh, the mat mole, we're going to simply just take uh, num seconds divided by in count to give us nanoseconds, which uh, actually one of these, let me update that real quick. Uh, where we have our, our the nanoseconds that it took, and we're going to report the count. So we're going to use a uh, time memory real quick and execute uh, example zero one. Uh, you can see from the report we have about thirty one million uh, uh, laps here of, of this iteration. And you can see it took about uh, ten point two four seconds. Okay, so with Timur, you can verify that Timur can achieve almost the identical amount of minimal overhead by substituting in the lightweight tuple and using the, the wall clock component. So we're gonna simply replace the explicit chrono usage. So we're gonna create a, um, a global end timer, just like uh, we had uh, in seconds and in count and this global uh, lightweight tuple actually keeps track of the count itself. So we don't need that additional variable. And we are gonna create a local instance that we're just gonna call timer. We're gonna trivially construct it. We're gonna start it and we're gonna stop it and then add it in to this global timer. And then we're gonna simply just print it out um, divided by the number of laps. And as you can see, using the, we're going to benchmark it again with time M. You can see that the overhead is, uh, a, it takes about 10.8 seconds to run. Okay, so the overhead um, of Timory in this situation is approximately about 19, 19 nanoseconds. The benefit, of course, is that uh, the way we defined these things here, for you know, an additional overhead of about 19 nanoseconds, um, you, we can trivially pretty much uh, replace any of that raw, raw usage. Um, we can trivially replace any of the, the, the components were collected with, with any other component in Timory, or we can include additional ones. Like for example, um, you know, if, if you wanted the number of voluntary context switches um, from, from the R usage metric, you could trivially sub that in. Um, so this one, uh, I know it's probably listed at, I think I put it at 30 minutes, but this should probably only take you about five, five, 10 minutes to implement. Feel free to, to run it, uh, verify, that uh, the overhead is similar to what I got on my local machine. And um, you know, obviously report if it's not the case, but you know, feel free uh, to, to try other components. You will find, uh, you know, like if you sub in CPU clock, it does take up quite a bit longer, but that's not because of Timory, that's simply because uh, looking up certain components um, 
have a higher overhead. Um, and that's 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 not Timory. That's just simply looking at uh, those values from the system are are heavier weight. Um, okay, Philip, uh, explain the difference between the lightweight component and the regular component. Why does this example need a lightweight component? Um, so we use the lightweight component here um, because the lightweight component, when you call start and stop here, if you were to use uh, the, the, the other bundlers, like a uh, component tipple here. Um, by default, when you call start um, and stop, they'll actually update uh, the global storage um, when start is called, um, effectively um, adding, more, adding more overhead because instead of, uh, this essentially just maps down almost identically to, to the instructions that you see here. Okay, you actually, you know, pull this up in a tool like um, Godbolt, uh, you'll see pretty much the identical same, the identical amount of instructions issued here. Uh, if, if you were to use another like component tipple, you would see quite a bit more instructions because the start and stop uh, each time you did here would actually update um, your global storage so, and then you would get a report at the end. Okay, and when you run this, you will see that there isn't a uh, wall clock that text output file generated. Um, the, the lightweight tipple here doesn't touch global memory. So everything that happens here is, is on the stack. Uh, to explain, uh, does that make sense, Philip? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, yeah, so just to clarify, Philip, what component bundles. Um, sort of component tuple, et cetera, they all call uh, when start, as you can see that there's a little bit more here going on versus here over here in uh, the lightweight tuple. You can see it pretty much just exactly calls start and then just toggles a, a variable to true. Whereas there's more instructions here for pushing, et cetera. Um, and we had another question in Slack, uh, or sorry, in the thing, Siraj, could you explain what a trait is? Um, uh, we'll actually, I think in the next session, we'll be getting into that. Um, this one was pretty simple. So I think if, if everybody's ready, uh, we could probably move on. And then uh, I'll, I'll address your, your question, <sighs> um, Siraj, as to what exactly a, a component, uh, a, a type trait is. Um, you can also look in the docs um, here in API type traits, there's, there's an overview. Okay, so moving on to to writing a component. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna create a, a normalization component. And essentially what this normalization component is gonna do is we're gonna create a, 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 a templated component which is templated on you know another component type and it takes uh, sort of like a, a a data size metric from the user code and uh, derives the, the metric from, from the comp component that is templated on and uh, averages out its value based on you know, the, the data size that you provided. 
Um, so for example, um, if we're using a wall clock component to loop over uh, data of size n, then normalized uh, wall clock will, will take this, this n size and divide the wall clock metric by the data size and essentially give you a value that is, is independent of um, problem size. Okay, so right normally when you increase the data size, you're, you, you, will, you won't be able to compare wall clock times uh, directly because naturally when you have more data, it's gonna take longer to process. But this normalization component will essentially give you a value that you can compare between um, different runs of different sizes. Okay, so Timory has this uh, capability to uh, derive derive component data. Um, you, you do this by setting a, a type trait called derivation types and providing a derived member function. Okay, so this, this type trait is a essentially you, you specify um, an alias within the structure that is a type list of a type list. And the, each type list entry within each inner type list entry is the set of components that are needed in order to derive um, that metric. So for example, the CPU utilization component can derive its value from the wall clock component and the CPU clock, or it can use the monotonic clock and the CPU clock because the CPU utilization is just a CPU clock divided by wall clock time. Okay, so uh, we specified this in a type trait. And we're gonna take a slightly modified uh, version of the, the basic solution from, from zero, zero. And we're gonna, we're gonna remove that auto stock auto start quirk so that we can actually, uh, you know, before it starts, we can actually provide the normalization data and then we're gonna call start. Okay, and you can see what it's essentially gonna look like here. And this is, this is an example of why um, all these functions return a reference to themselves. Um, it's so that you can chain functions into a, a single line. You can call you know, store and then you can call start directly. Okay, so instead of starting upon construction, before we start, we're actually gonna store, um, we're gonna call store and we're gonna pass in the data size and then we're gonna start. Okay, this normalization right here type is just a, 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 a dummy type uh, that we're gonna use uh, to, to ensure that this integer that's passed in is really only passed uh, to, to our normalization component. Okay, because you know there are there are Timory components for for data trackers that that track integer values, and if you simply were to provide uh, an integer here, um, then this this integer might actually get tracked by the integer tracker. So we're going to start off in components.hpp. We need to forward declare um, our component. So template type name t struct normal. And then we're going to set uh, four type traits. We're going to set the der derivation types in components.hpp. Um, we're going to define the statistics type by looking up the statistic types of statistic type of type T. Um, we're going to set the is available type trait uh, based on whether or not T is available. 
And then we're going to modify the, the base class so that it, it only has one member function or one member value. We're going to get rid of the accumulate member value because effectively type T has value in accumulate in it. So there's there's no need to have both. Um, so the default implementation of say uh, the uh, statistics type trait in namespace tem trait is 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 void. And for example, wall wall clock has a statistic type of double. So the wall clock it specializes this statistic type trait and provides double for our normalized component normalized is is based on t so we need to look up the statistic cycle of t thus um, we instead of a explicit specialization we're going to still keep the template type name um, and we're just going to look up the statistic cycle of t okay so this is uh, what's called a type dependent specialization. And we're going to do this for, for all the different type traits in, in trait T. So derivation types of normalized T, we're just going to specify a single, single type list of, of T. For is available, we're going to set uh, the is available type by another uh, argument dependent lookup, and we're gonna set that value to the value of is available for T. So when dealing with type traits, for the most part, only you only have these two values. You have a type lookup value, and then sometimes you have a, a, a Boolean value. These are used uh, at compile time um, by Timory internal. Really, you know, you, you might not be familiar looking at this stuff, but they, in general, are are pretty simple to implement. And uh, Timur provides a bunch of macros so that you don't actually have to to write out a lot of this stuff. Okay, so we're gonna then we're gonna define the component declaration. Uh, we're gonna provide uh, four sort of metadata functions and values. Uh, we're going to provide a static label. So that's essentially what's used for the file name output. And essentially, you just want to look up T label and add in normalized. So like instead of, you know, if it's if it's normalized of wall clock, you want the output file to be normalized underscore wall clock. Um, we're going to provide the description. Again, same sort of thing. Description. Uh, we're going to look at the unit of, of type T and we're going to set it to the same. We're going to look at the display unit of type T and set it to the same. And then because we are we're normalized normalizing values, we're going to set this format flags to default to scientific. Okay, so that essentially um, I left out the definitions here. Um, hopefully from these hints, you'll be able to figure out what the implementations are. And then for the format flags, you essentially just have to pass in scientific size T. Uh, then we, we need a, a, a value to uh, store the data size. We're going to default that to one. So that if it's not provided, it's just uh, the metric is provided by one. And we're going to uh, define a, a store member function that takes a normal that normalization dummy struct as the first parameter, and then you pass in that size. And this implementation should essentially just take this SC uh, size and assign it to data size. And then for the remaining uh, member functions, we need to provide our derived member function. Uh, derived needs to return a bool. Um, 
this is this is a, a requirement and you simply need to return uh, whether or not the value uh, was was actually um, uh, when you derived it whether or not it was a valid derivation um, because as I mentioned earlier this can take multiple type lists and what that bull provides is it essentially tells Timory to to stop looping over these these type lists when when a matching derivation is found. Okay, so that's what that that bool there provides. So in this situation, you're you're pretty much always going to return true if if t is a valid pointer. Um, and then for our get value. We just uh, we want to return value dot get divided by the data size, which is you know in the case of a wall clock would be wall clock dot get divided by the data size, and then for the get display um, member function, that uh, simply provides um, this get display is only used when you're actually printing out say to SDC out. Um, and in this situation, some, some components will actually uh, return strings from get display. So you want to make a copy of uh, your metric, divide the metric by the data size, and then return the get display from your metric. In the derive, as I said, check that uh, V is, is valid and make a copy and then return whether or not B is equal to null pointer. Um, and then we actually in, instrument it here. We're gonna create that function. We're gonna store, call store, and we're gonna provide that normalization size. So for the outer loop, this say wall clock time uh, should be normalized based on um, the number of iterations, and then each of these data sizes that we used here. And then for these um, sub, sub instrumentations, we, we pass in essentially the, the number of loops that happen within these, uh, the algorithms that are called here. Okay, and then so when you run it, we'll have you run it with two different data sizes. So a 200 by 200 matrix with uh, 10 iterations and then a 400 by 400 matrix with uh, 20 iterations. And when I ran it locally, you can see that that first one took about 0 0.7 seconds and the other took about 12.5. But you can see from the normalized wall clock, we actually have values that despite the different problem set sizes, these values are all within, you know, two to maybe, I think I said 10% here, but I think most of them are within 5%, 5 or 6% of each other. Okay, any, any questions for that? Just as a reminder, the, the solutions folder is available. You know, I encourage you to, to, to try and instrument it yourself, but uh, it, it is available here um, for you to look up if need be. Okay, let's move on. Hopefully we had enough time there. Um, I did push some, some minor changes um, to the solution that uh, make it more valid for uh, more complex data structures. Um, but we're running short on time, so if anybody's interested.
you're going to follow up with me. Okay, let's move on to everybody can see my screen. Yes. Um, let's move on to replacing functions. So this requires gotcha support. Um, this is pretty, pretty easy. We have, um, this uses gotcha, uh, which is sort of like an LD preload API. Um, in this uh, example, we're gonna, we're gonna replace git random. Um, there's a little description here. Uh, basically what gotcha components need is to know the, the return type and the arguments for a function. And then they need to know the name of the symbol in the binary. So if uh, the if it's a, a C linkage function function, it's very easy. It's just going to be the name of the function. Um, if the function is a C plus plus function, then you actually have to get the mangled name. Okay. So for example, uh, get random, get other random. You can look them up via nn, and you just have to provide this string. There is a helper macro that uh, will do some limited mangling. But in this example, you won't have to actually look things up in nn. So the way function replacement works is you essentially just provide a, a, a struct, um, and it needs to have the, the concept that it's a component. Um, and you can achieve that just by inheriting it. You need to have these two aliases. And then you essentially provide an, an operator, a function call operator that uh, matches the function signature of the function that you're replacing. Okay, so we're going to replace git random and we're just going to change it, change the, the implementation to return a negative uh, canonical number. Um, then we're just going to create a little little function that you can call called replace function. Uh, you declare a component, specify the number of components that it's going to uh, functions that it's going to replace, the components to wrap around the function. So in this case, since we're replacing the function, this has to be empty. And you specify the type that's doing the replacing. And you can use these macros. Um, these, these three are equivalent. You can just use the first one uh, for this example. And you specify the, the gotcha component, the index, which must be less than uh, nmax here. And then you can provide the function name and the macro will, will generate this string. Okay, so then you simply um, add in a, a argument that you can do to call this function replace function. And whenever replace function is called, anywhere that get random is called will be replaced with your implementation. Okay, so this is, this is particularly useful. Um, to essentially um, have instrumentation or uh, you know debugging mode or features that um, are not by default enabled, but you can create a little library that you know when which has a function which uh, when when called will replace these functions globally and do something different. Okay, so go ahead and do that exercise, and unfortunately. Um, we are running a little short on time, so um, give you about six minutes because the the next one is very very similar. Okay, let's. Go move on to the wrap function. It's a, it's essentially a very um, very similar, but instead of replacing the function, 
um, it, it, will, it will still call the original function, but it will wrap uh, Timory around it. So essentially uh, happens when Timory wraps it is you, you've specified in the gotcha type a, a bundle type. And it will create a bundle of that type and it will pass in the, the tool ID. It will call the construct member functions with, with the uh, arguments to the function. It will call start. It will call the audit member function uh, with uh, this data, which is a, a gotcha structure. Um, it'll do a tag dispatch uh, of, of type audit incoming so that you know in your overload that these are the incoming arguments, and then it will provide all the arguments. It will call the original function, uh, capture that return value, call the audit member function with the uh, outgoing tag, and, and provide you with that return value, and then stop. OK, so in this exercise, we're going to create an argument logger which essentially um, takes the, the incoming arguments to the functions that it wraps, and it's going to store those arguments in uh, the metadata file. So later, when, when in, in Timory metadata.json, uh, you'll see these functions. We're going to wrap set seed. You'll have in your, in your metadata what set seed was called with, and uh, we're going to wrap execute mat mole um, matrix multiply with the arguments that it was provided. Okay. Um, we're going to slightly modify what we did previously. Um, for for our gotcha, we're going to specify um, you know max of eight functions. It's just kind of arbitrary. Uh, we're going to specify the components to wrap around it as a just a tuple of this argument logger class. And then we're just going to um, specify that it's part of the MM API that we created previously. We're going to create a little function that actually returns um, a, a, a tuple of this gotcha. And the benefit here, um, the way we're going we're to um, construct this is it actually creates a, a handle that allows you to, to start wrapping functions and stop wrapping functions. So you can essentially scope. Um, you, can, you have your function wrappers are scoped um, between those start and stops, um, as opposed to just universally and always applied. And you do that by instead of, you know, originally we just explicitly called these, these macros. We're actually going to wrap these macros in the, the gotcha type initializer. And then we're going to uh, create a unique pointer to that gotcha, um, a tuple of that gotcha. And therefore, when, when handled up, um, and this unique pointer is called start, it will execute this initializer. And when stop is called, it will uh, rewind uh, these, these gotcha wrappers. Okay. And then for our, our audit implementation, uh, we're simply just going to say that uh, we have for at least one argument, if that, uh, it's only one argument, then we're simply going to add, uh, use the manager metadata, pass in the function name and the argument. And if it's multiple arguments, then we're going to generate um, a tuple, which is why uh, here in this output, see set seed only had one argument, so therefore you have that value directly, whereas SQMet mole had three arguments, and you see the, the tuple of arguments. Um, upon exful, successful execution, you will uh, see these messages printed out. Additionally, for debugging, you know you can you can use this feature to to also um, check for say functions which are are past 
um, as null pointers. Uh, so this is just for reference here. You can just, we have a component called pointer checker um, and it uses what's called a fold expression to, to inspect each one of these arguments. And if a null pointer is found in one of the arguments, it prints out a backtrace. In that situation, you'd simply uh, replace argument logger here with your pointer checker. Um, okay, well, feel free to, to work on that. And we've got about five minutes left, so uh, if you have any remaining questions, please let me know. Thanks everybody for attending. Um, yeah, feel free to file an issue or a feature request if you have any.